We're going to talk about what a supercomputer is a thing. And it's a computer, it's super, it means bigger. Um, and we use it in science for two prim primary purposes. We analyze data, so this is the CERN accelerator in Geneva. It's very large, it uses a lot of energy, and it collects 16 petabytes of data per year. A petabyte is 1,000 terabytes, so 16 petabytes becomes something like 4,000 very large hard drives. We have to use very large computers to analyze those data. Approximately 200,000 CPUs worldwide goes into this task. And the other thing we use it for is simulations. We have a nice scientific model of something. We'd like to know where it takes us. What we have over here is a climate simulation where we can see all the ocean currents. Uh, and the idea is what happens if the global uh, warming increases by half a degree centigrade. And for that, we need to do a lot of forward simulations. We have to simulate the weather everywhere in the world every six hours. There's 50 million points in this. The temperature, humidity, pressure, and other things have to be calculated in eight of these 50 million points for four times every day. And then you have to run a few hundred years to get anything that's stable. So this simulation is the result of 4,000 CPUs working for a few weeks to produce that, that result. And the kind of machines that we then call supercomputers are things like these. This is the biggest machine in Europe called Uqueen. Each of these racks have 18,500 CPUs. There are 25 of such racks, so that brings us to 468,000 CPUs in total. And a CPU like that uses a lot of electricity and a lot of cooling water. So what you're seeing over here at the last picture is all the machines stacked on top of each other. The orange cables are used for the computers to communicate with each other. The black hoses are water going in to cool and remove all the energy. So a machine like this uses 2.3 megawatts. The biggest machine in the world, the Chinese Tian A2, spends 25 megawatts. That's the same as the residential electricity consumption in Copenhagen and Fredericksburg. So approximately 600,000 homes would use that kind of electricity. And the Chinese machines, by approximately New Year's, will be doubled in size. That means that it takes as much electricity as the greater Copenhagen area in households just to run one computer. So what's the problem from a researcher's point of view in, in using a very large supercomputer? Well, a computer has a clock frequency. We all bought a computer and uh, looked at what the clock frequency is. A nice one will have 3.3 gigahertz. Inside, a compute core, we have four pipelines. We, in principle, do four instructions every clock cycle. In reality, we usually get three. Although each CPU has 16 of those cores, each computer has four CPUs of each 16 cores. And to be a supercomputer, you then have to have at least 10,000 computers. So if we sum that up, for every nanosecond, that means that we get something like three clock cycles, each of which produces three uh, co computations. So we're at nine computations per nanosecond. We have 16 cores, so that brings us to 144 computations per nanosecond in one core, and to 576 computations per computer per nanosecond. And then if you have 10,000 of those in the computer, you end up at 5.7 million instructions per nanosecond. And a nanosecond, how much is that? Well, it's 10 to the minus 9th of a second. Um, if you take it in light, then the rule of thumb is that light moves one foot per nanosecond. So in one nanosecond, light moves 25 centimeters. In one tenth of a nanosecond, the time to to do one operation, light moves 2.1 
2.5 centimeters. <coughs> so the problem for us is that in 0.1 of a nanosecond, where light can move this far, the computer can make one calculation. To get to the closest thing it has of memory, called level one cache, it will take one to two nanoseconds. So that's 10 to 20 calculations. If it needs to go further out, it grows into four to five nanoseconds. The third level cache becomes 10 nanoseconds. And if we have to go to main memory, we actually have to go to 28 nanoseconds. Doesn't sound like a lot, but the computer does a calculation every 0.1 nanosecond. So we're at 200, uh, 280 computations just to get to memory. And if we go to another computer, ask it to do something for us, we're talking about 20 microseconds. So that's the three orders of magnitude more. We're now at the time where it, it takes, in, we can do 200,000 calculations in the same time, it takes us to send a message to one neighboring computer. And if we need to answer back again, we're growing to 400,000 calculations. So our biggest problem is how do we divide work so that 10,000 CPUs, or so half a million CPUs, can work efficiently in parallel and not waste all their time waiting for each other. So we'll end up with a lot of machines. In the Chinese version, 3.2 million of these. And we have to program them, and programming them is fairly easy if they're just communicating with their neighbors. So you can do this, and I can do that, and we can exchange information. Uh, I also have to communicate with the, the other ones. So if I'm one of these center nodes, I'll have four of neighbors to communicate with. But not all programs are made so that I only need to communicate with my neighbor node. Sometimes I need to communicate with somebody arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you can count the steps getting from here to here. It's a lot more than 20 microseconds. And then it adds to the complexity of writing a correct program. So if we make a very simple example, a heat equation. So we'll take some piece of metal. We'll make it cool on three sides and heat it on one side and figure out what does the temperature gradient throughout the metal plate look like. Physically, it's a very simple calculation. We just take that every point becomes the average temperature of itself and its four neighbors. So to calculate the whole plate, we're going, basically going to say that these points plus these points plus these <coughs> points plus these points plus these points divided by five gives us the solution. And if you write that up in programming language C, which is what most physicists would use, uh, it looks something like this. We have quite a few lines to do something very simple. This program only run on one CPU. If you need it to run on 10,000 CPUs, it looks something like this. It's a lot more complex. We cannot even see it any longer. At least we cannot read it uh, on the screen. And basically what we're trying to, to say is a very small program like this. It's only five lines of code. So we in our research, try to let this program run as efficiently as this program over here. And if we take a larger example than that, this is called a shallow water, where we take two drops of water, we let them look at how the waves uh, propagate. What was five lines in the previous slide is now something like 50. So you can multiply that by 100 to get to something it would look like in C or C++. And we'd like to run that program on a supercomputer. Well, that works, actually. So if we just run on one machine with 32 CPUs, because of the 32 CPUs and some extra things we can do, we can actually make the whole thing run 47 times faster. And if we take a network of such machines, eight of those, so now we have 256 CPUs, we can actually make the whole thing run almost 300 times faster than the original version. And that allows a physicist to come up with a new idea and have it tested within a week rather than within two or three years. 
and that's our end goal to make supercomputers an easier tool to use for science. And that's the end of what a supercomputer is.